Welcome everybody and thank you so, so much for joining our Be Women weekly webinars where we share, we connect, we learn, we become connected with the, in love and, care, and caring and, and what is important to us in the, in the midst of this actually very challenging times in these moments of isolations, in these moments where we actually can use them as an amazing opportunity to reimagine our future to reimagine who we want to be personally, who we want to be professional, and very important, who we want to be as global citizens. What are we going to stand for? I'm Laura Jadrukoch, a founder of Be Women, a lawyer in the state of New York and Argentina, very passionate about using business as a force for good. And this webinar will last around 60 minutes, and you will be amazed and absolutely inspired. Our speaker today is very special, Mandeep Ria. She is author of The Value Compass. A, a, a Mandeep is a global authority on values. Exactly, what do we need to revalue what matters in our lives? So she works with companies, institutions, and individuals around the world. And her quest has been to understand values valuation of companies, valuation of people, values from the heart. And so she has an amazing uh, trajectory. She is a BBC journalist, uh, inquisitive mind, a creative mind, interested in politics and in economics, uh, studied at the London Business School of Economics and an MBA from the London Business School and a PhD in global values. So she has traveled around 150 countries to understand the values of each country. So today that we're sitting at home, we're gonna have, a, uh, we're gonna travel around the world in 150 countries to understand values. So one more thing before we, I give the word to uh, Mandeep that we're gonna do a dialogue is to understand what is, uh, who are we, be women for, who are we? So we are a global network of women all around the world who are now connecting by, by Zoom in an amazing way. And this global network of women is seeking to, to, uh, to balance purpose and profits and to move towards what is a, uh, a caring economy, an economy in which this, uh, we generally care for people and nature as our top priority, where our values, 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 values of respect, dignity, collaboration uh, are our driving forces. So a few more seconds. What is the Be Women Empowering Move that is so important to give us energy and to energize us through the whole of this value travel for in 150 countries is to move your back, your, your shoulders back, your chin up, your uh, eyes that twinkle with joy and determination and with a super wide smile. Uh, Mandeep, the line is all yours. Tell us a little bit about you and why you're doing this. Thank you. What an introduction. I remember um, listening to these webinars before. I've always been inspired every Friday when they're held. And this moment in which you ask us to put our shoulders back, put our chin up and smile, I have remembered it every single day since I first heard it when you said it. And actually it has changed my lockdown kind of mentality almost because you can easily be like this over your phone or be like this thinking, you know, whatever, whatever mood or state you're in and immediately your state changes. So firstly, just thank you. A huge gratitude for uh, starting us off in that way and for your introduction. Um, my name's Dr. Mandeep Rai, Ko Mandeep Ko Rai Dillon. I'm gonna talk about names and what they mean during this uh, conversation, but that is my full name. And on the book, we have Mandeep Rai. Um, I have, yes, as Laura said, traveled 150 countries. And the aim of today is to really inspire you, ignite you, empower you, so that after this hour you feel different, you move differently, and you think differently. So Mandeep, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what led you to this journey? Because really, I mean, it's, it's so timely and so wonderful to hear from you about what your journey, because we're all at home in isolation. Give us wings yes. to imagine. Yes, well, I would never have thought 
Um, actually, when I was writing the book, people had said, uh, this is the book here. Um, and people had said, why are you breaking it down into countries where such a globalized world now, we're such a global economy. Um, you don't, we don't, we're global citizens. You don't need to think about countries. And then boom, as the book comes out, within a month, we are all locked down in our individual countries and our countries are 100% defining our, you know, our day-to-day -day activity. What your government says is or isn't allowed is what we're doing. Um, so I obviously could not have foreseen that, but what the book does or what I did was just look at each and every nation that I had, um, actually 101, I just thought 101 sounded better than 150. Uh, maybe the next book will have the other 99 countries. Um, chose 101 and thought about the value or the treasure or the gift that that country offers. What led me to do this? That's a very good question. Well, from, from what I can see of, we're well, not all women, I can see that there's some men in the in the audience here. Um, but I guess my journey, the reason perhaps I took this journey, and this is, I'm really saying this, I've not said it in any other interview that um, I have held so far, but personally between you and I, in this kind of intimate environment, the truth is I did this all thinking my mother's gonna get me married off and then my freedom will go. That'll be the end. I'll be, you know, I better live as much as I can before I die or get married. <laughs> so no, um, you're married and happily married and you have a kid. So it was not that bad. <laughs> you're right. Well, thankfully I chose it, it. It is such that I have a good partner and it isn't that bad, but I know many women who, whose life drastically changes after marriage. And sometimes, their life is limited before marriage in order to, so that their expectations don't grow too much after marriage. I remember distinctly being told that, you know, um, don't, get, don't, don't treat your father's house too liberally or don't have too much fun because once you get married, you then won't be able to handle marriage. <laughs> so so it was, yeah, it was kind of like being limited so that you can always handle the life of, slight limitation so but again i haven't said this in any other interview this is very personal i know but you know your mother had a very big influence in you and uh, and what happened why why is your mother maybe the reason of writing this book and and what happened afterwards yes um my mother is in the first line the first page the first she's the beginning of this story um, when I was 18, I got a place at the University of Oxford. And here in England, where I'm born and brought up, that is kind of creme de la creme. And she said, oh, if you go to Oxford, who will marry you if you go to Oxford? Like, why? I mean, how are we going to find someone in, from within our Indian community, within the caste culture, um, part of India where from to tick all the other boxes we need to tick and then for them to be that educated no better you just choose somewhere normal be a normal girl and lead a normal life um, and I'm my mother's confidant her best friend her golden child her daughter and so I, I obeyed I had obeyed up till then and I obeyed at that point also and as soon as I did that I thought wow maybe maybe I missed a trick there. Maybe there comes a point where you have to start making decisions that, that fulfill you. It's not that my mother wanted anything different to what I wanted. We both wanted a happy life for me, but the way to get there is slightly different. She thought the way to get there would be to do what her mother did to her, which was to get her married off at the so-called right time to the right kind of guy and therefore settle her so that she will then have a nice provided for happy life. Um, and I just wanted something slightly different. It's not that I didn't want a partner, it's that, that I didn't want that future, but I wanted to live and be educated and explore the world. And I just had a huge thirst for knowledge. Um, and so our values were at conflict. We wanted the same outcome, but what we treasured on the way were different. 
she was treasuring stability, um, family, security. I was treasuring freedom, knowledge, the vive le jeu, like just to live as much as possible. And hence the story begins. Yeah, so then on that note, if you can tell us, you know, how, how did this book come about in the sense that you decided to travel one, from one country to the other? I guess you, you first started a, studying your, your PhD and, uh, and then you realized there's, there's more to just uh, getting a PhD and writing a, a thesis that is, is, a, is a maybe read by your mother and a few others and, uh, and write something that will be read by the world and contribute to the world. So tell us a little bit about it. I'm glad you asked the question because a little bit, it was the other way around, a PhD, you know, mother of necessity, I'll, I'll tell you how. So I, after graduating, um, I went and start. I was on a whim, I was um, hired for a women in the city program by JP Morgan. So top investment banks were hiring top female graduates and said to those female graduates, don't worry, we will make sure that you can balance all the rest of your life. If you join us, we'll look after you. And although that is true, um, the fundamental, uh, fundamentally, they still need long hours, which, you know, you have to make choices. You have to make choices in terms of how you raise your children. But more importantly, I was there employed to make rich people richer. And that didn't quite sit with my value set. So as soon as I had a moment a few years into the job, I was given the chance to take a short sabbatical by my female boss, who I'm still in touch with. She's a huge empowering agent. And she said, if you need to, if you need to just think things through, take three months and your job will still be here. And in that period, um, I went to Central America and serendipity happened. And I asked a lady to take some of my belongings to LA so that I could be just Cuban in Cuba, so that I could not have any belongings and fall into the Cuban economy, the peso economy, pretend I was a Cuban the whole time I was there, which was a month, and not have a tourist experience in Cuba, but have a Cuban experience in Cuba. And she, when she, when I went to get my luggage from LA, she didn't leave it in lost property. Her name's Kathy Eldon, and she runs an organization called Creative Visions. She, in fact, said, if you, want your, if you want your belongings, you're going to have to come to my home. And when I got to her home, she asked who I was, what I was doing. And I had been to all the countries that they were, uh, that they were researching for a, an, for a PBS documentary series. And she said, what are you doing? Can you help us? Um, and that's how I got involved in kind of media and journalism. And then I began to see that the countries that I was naturally interested in were an asset that I could use them. Um, and after that job, I then went on to work for the BBC World Service. And my job was a dream job. I spent my 20s going from one country to the next, reporting on what I thought um, and what I would talk to the World Service about would be informative, engaging, um, social, humanitarian, important issues. And if they thought the same, as in if they thought it would be of interest to a a businessman in Japan and a grandma in Rwanda and uh, a school child in Uruguay, then normally I would, I would, uh, they'd accept the pitch and I'd report, I'd put the radio program would go on air. And so that's how I traveled over 150 different countries. I would report back from each place, telling people the incredible stories that were happening in each of these places, because often media is focusing on the catastrophe. Yeah what went wrong and and some parts of media are focusing on the opposite and so the book really came about because each place i'd go to after my daily report or weekly report when i was leaving that country i would then write a summary email to my friends and family saying this is what i found most inspirational about japan or this is what struck me about madagascar or you know and that summary email people would write, it would be passed around to people's friends or friends or friends or friends and people would write back and say, this needs to go into a book one day. And I thought, yes, 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 one day when I retire, I will certainly make a book or something. And it wasn't until I fell pregnant that I had this huge desire to want to culminate all those stories and pass them on as a gift 
really to the next generation. Um, and originally the book was going to be called Letters to My Unborn Child, but I didn't manage to do it within the nine months. And this is where the PhD comes in. The more I wrote, the more I realized, actually I wanted to have more rigor to each of these, each of the pieces. I wanted more, I wanted it to really be substantiated and that then led me to the PhD. So this journey started off with my first child and then tried to write it within the second pregnancy with my second child, I still didn't manage. In fact, it has taken me a decade to get this book out. Wow, I mean, this is amazing. This is, you're the, the true uh, adventurer because uh, uh, your life didn't, didn't start to say, I'm gonna study law, I'm gonna do an MBA, I'm gonna work. So you started like with a traditional route, but now, but then your life just, you, what you did is you let your heart open and, and let the possibilities uh, bring you to where your, your maximum capabilities are. So this is beautiful to know and how important it is for everybody on, on the line to understand that please see where your life can take you. Because can you tell us a little bit of, of, of the journey of one, why did you decide to go from one country to the other? And tell us a bit of, of several countries so that we can hear more about the, your experience country by country. Absolutely. Firstly, I'd like to say, although I led my heart lead, I also, my mind would still come in. And I'm, I'm really glad that when we were um, on the line and you were, we were waiting, we were talking about meditation and other things. So um, I was very aware that, uh, I was very aware of what was required to, to live in this world. I'm a Sikh and Sikhs are, spiritual and yet practical. We're kind of, we call ourselves warrior saints or warriors, warrior, yeah, warrior saints. As in, there's a strong part of kind of spirituality, meditation, and then there's a strong part of kind of making sure that you're contributing society and you live, you know, you're, you're in this world and you're not just up in the mountains meditating. And this kind of comes, the reason I mention this is because although I was traveling and following my heart, Every time I'd see a problem, I'd think, what can I do here? Sometimes what I could do was produce uh, a piece that went out onto radio or TV or an article. At other times, I was really struck by, for example, the inequality that I was seeing. And I really, it struck me most in India where I could easily have been any one of these young girls that I was reporting about. Why did I have the privilege I did? And what, what can we do so that everyone can share everyone can share the resources of this planet more equally. That led me to um, thinking about places like the World Bank, United Nations, European Union. And so that led me to do a master's in development economics and then take an international development type of route. Um, and equally, I saw business often stepping in where government or where international development didn't. And so I also worked for media venture capital within the media within the Middle East to change actually the way that Islam is perceived especially after 9-11 I was asked to set up this uh, venture capital fund in Abu Dhabi and that led me on to do an MBA and then the book led me on to do, to do a PhD the reason I say these things is because I would be misleading you if I said it was just a fanciful free beautiful heartfelt journey it was and I'm extremely free-spirited but equally practical and doing kind of practical jobs and educating myself along the way. And I think those, the combination of the two has meant that, and hopefully you'll see it in the book where I interview prime ministers, presidents, but also um, economists, journalists, authors, also musicians and artists, um, you know, CEOs and uh, the shoe cleaner, all of those different types of voices are in this book. So as I would travel to each country, the aim would be really to, sh to kind of sh highlight the, okay, my belief is that humanity is always wanting to evolve into its very best self. The human spirit is such that it wants to evolve into its best self. But how we're able to do that is actually very much defined by our social, political, geographical, historical context. So each country is the same. It's trying to be, it is evolving into its best self, 
but it's determined by all of those social political uh, circumstances. So whereas America can be super entrepreneurial because it's very young, its population has um, grown up in a certain way where they, you know, largely came from Ireland or England, cut their roots, started again, and they're able to pivot and keep on trying things until they work. A country with a much longer history and greater legacy and deeper legacy, for example, I'm thinking of a more indigenous country in, in um, South America, for example, might value tradition and the indigenous roots or even nature more so. And so it's really just seeing what what do we value? Because I believe that all of these values are actually gifts that we all hold, but where we choose to put our focus is a choice that we have. Um, and so, so that's why it's kind of, you know, you rightly said it's a book for this moment because at the moment we're, we're deciding, we, it's almost free for. Within our day, we can decide who we talk to. It's not being determined by who you meet on the bus or who you're meeting at work or circumstances and situations. We have a lot more choice right now. And because of this, we can be very deliberate and very, and think more about how do I want to fill my day? Who do I want to speak to? What are the influences that I want? And what do I want my future to look like? Wow, amazing. I mean, the, the richness that you have brought into this book uh, and, and, the, and the expansion and, and the complexity and the beauty of this of humanity that you brought is amazing. But I want to really hone down on, on you, a girl traveling alone uh, a few years ago. I remember when I was uh, uh, 18, I also went on a, uh, at that time, you know, backpacking trip throughout Latin America. And it, it was amazing. But tell us a little bit about your experience on that, how it happened, because you went to 150 countries. Wow. How, how, weren't your parents scared? <laughs> like mine? And at that time, you know, 30 years ago, there was no cell phones. There were just letters and telegrams. Yeah, it's so true. So I remember this was one time where I was um, in Laos. And in Laos, they have this in Prabhabang, I think, or uh, they have this, it, there's this river. It's a very famous river that runs through the country. And um, they have this sport called tubing, where you literally squeeze, plop your bum onto this tube, onto like a big wheel of a car. And well, actually the inner of the car, the inner wheel. And you rush down through the through this river like rapids, you know. So you 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 just kind of make your way from one part of the country to the other, using this river as your transport, using this tube as your transport, the inner wheel, and uh, and it's really exhilarating, amazing, until you if you lose your tube and then you're really stuck. And that's what happened to me. I there was a moment when I it's the nearest to death experience I've ever had. I fell off the tube. I went under into a rapid and before I knew it, I was closer and closer to the riverbed. I couldn't see it above me. I couldn't feel anything above me. I hadn't breathed. So I'm underwater. It's like in a washing machine, underwater in the rapids. And, and the only thought that went through my head is, wow, my mother's not even going to know where Lao is, where her daughter went. Um, <laughs> She's just going to think I never came back home. She might not even ever know that I died or anything. How would anyone, because I'm completely, I'm just in a, in a bathing suit and, and I'm going to drown. That's it. No one's ever going to know. And, I, and besides, actually, my mother didn't even know there was a country called Lao or that I was in Lao. So clearly... My mother is right to be worried about my safety and any mother would be for any child. Um, but to your point about um, a girl traveling the world, I do think I, well, one, I was extremely lucky in this occasion when I was drowning, there was a really deep rooted tree. And thankfully my foot got stuck into the root of that tree and I, was able to climb up the roots of the tree to the point that I could breathe. And a boy, a little boy on the ravine saw me. And he, um, I kind of like waved as in like my hand finally came out of the water and I waved at him and he waved back and then came 
and put his hand on the root of the tree so that slowly I was able to grab his hand and we went towards the bank of, the, of that ravine. But the way we got out of the ravine was like a human ladder. He would stick his hands and legs into the soil. I would climb over him. I would stick my hands and legs into the soil. He would climb over me. And we like climbed over each other in order to get out of that deep ravine to then finally get onto the kind of the proper land where the rest of the humans were living. So, <laughs> so yes, there were, I think if I don't, if I didn't complete that, you'd always wonder why, why didn't she drown or how is she living? How is she telling this tale? It was thanks to that boy and that boy's picture is in the book. Um, but I also think that I was extremely, extremely blessed and lucky throughout all of those experiences that that's one of the, that's, the only kind of major near-death experience I had. There were a few others, but nothing disastrous, thankfully, ever happened. I mean, sometimes my backpack would be stolen. Sometimes I remember I slept with a door under the handle of the, um, a door wedged so that the handle wouldn't move of the, the door handle wouldn't move. Sorry, a chair would be wedged so that the door handle wouldn't move, you know? So I'm like making sure that I have layers of protection and layers of security. Um, but on the whole, I was trusted. I was um, treated like people's family member or daughter or sister. And I just think I, was, I had a huge advantage due to the fact that I was young and female. And people just immediately felt that, well, she can't possibly be a threat. So if she's not a threat, she's an ally. And trusted me and shared with me. And I literally cannot repay the kindness of strangers that I received. My husband and I have decided that our home here in London will be a hotel for anyone who ever needs anything ever, because the way people helped us and me in particular um, was very open hearted. That is so beautiful. I guess I, I had a similar experience 30 years ago when I was in Peru, uh, uh, life experience uh, uh, situation in, and also in, in Africa and so forth. But it's very interesting the trust because uh, through trust, you actually built the concept of values per country. And so if you can expand a little bit more about how did you decide uh, to call Uruguay uh, the value you decided or other countries, what, what, what inspired you? What went over and over the that, that situation that you, you created a, a value per country? Um, great question. I'm not sure if this is a female trait or if this, this is a journalistic trait or what this is, but I, my kind of the way I went about going to each place was that I would just feel the place. I wouldn't, I try not to research too much beforehand. I didn't want to go in with bags of judgments because knowledge is always coming from someone's perspective. And I didn't want to carry anyone's perspective before I got there. So I deliberately try not to read uh, The Lonely Planet or read, and it, it's not to say I didn't carry a guidebook, I did. But before going there, I would try and be a blank slate. And when I'm there, I would just be very aware, open, um, maybe sensitive, maybe intuitive. The reason I say that is because I just made myself into a sponge who was gonna soak things up because I'm there to really just soak up the experience. I'm not there for a fancy hotel. I'm not there to lead the same life that I'm leading back at home. I have no intention of sitting in a hotel room or sitting on a beach or, you know, that, that is not my purpose. My purpose was to see what could be a value here to the rest of the world. So when I'm reporting for the BBC World Service, I'm thinking, what is it that people don't already know that could be valuable to them? Um, and in doing that, I'm just, I'm just much more open and, and, um, and just really just kind of, uh, in being a sponge, I can give you an example. We spoke about trustness just now. I remember very vividly before I went to Qatar, which is the country that I gave the value of trust. Before I even got there, a friend of mine said, can you, can you take this package? And it needs to go to, and he told me the name and I put the name on the envelope and um, 
And he said, when you get to the airport, give it to anyone and they'll deliver it. And it had a name and address. And I'm saying, what do you mean I can give it to anyone? Why don't you tell, you know, either I put it in the post box or you tell me where it needs to go. But if I just give it to anyone, it won't get there. And he said, believe me, it will get there. And it did, but I just didn't, you know, I couldn't believe how he trusted his countrymen. And there was another occasion in Qatar itself where we, I was in, I was actually um, pregnant or had a child, like very young child or my friend was pregnant. I remember both of us being in need. I think I had a three month old and she was pregnant. So these are two women, you know, like in a particular circumstance and we're in the car and we're at a roundabout and the car breaks down. And a gentleman comes to that windscreen, to the kind of, the, you know, side windscreen and says, or to the side car door and said, um, do you need help? And more than me and more than my little baby was the fact that my friend was pregnant and we had just broken down. So I said, yeah, we kind of do need help. I don't know really what to do. And he said, both of you step out of my, step out of your car, take my car, here are my car keys, you guys go back home and I'll make sure your card is delivered. Wow. And so he had the car fixed, he bought our car back, but much more importantly, he trusted us with his car. And I thought, what kind of a world is this where people can trust each other like that, where people don't, still don't lock their door at night? I mean, some people do, don't get me wrong, there are cities, but the Qataris generally within each other, it's such a tight knit, everyone knows everyone and your behavior matters. And so the way you use your word and if you're going to break that trust, the impact of that is such that you will actually just keep people's trust. You keep your own integrity through that and you keep your family's honor through that. And, and, so, and so society goes forward. And for that to continue, and it's a relatively young country, you know, it's, really the Qataris, those kind of um, originally nomadic people became settlers, so they all knew each other. Um, and there's not actually many Qataris and it takes, I don't think you can actually ever become a Qatari. You can become a national ultimately, but you can't become a Qatari. So there's a, it's a very closed, very particular type of population where it's possible. I'm not sure it would even be possible in a big, big uh, cosmopolitan country, a uh, cosmopolitan city. But my point being that if you live your life to that degree of trust, or if trust is so important to you, and you know, it is inspirational at how different your life would be and how it would go when you honor someone's word and you honor your own word in that way. Another example you had was Uruguay. Uruguay's um, value is humility. It is impossible not to see the difference between, and I'm sure, Larry, you would agree with this, between Argentina, um, Brazil, and Uruguay. Here's this tiny country sitting between these massive giants. There's no point flaunting your wealth, even if you do have it, because one, they're just not those type of people, but two, they'll never have enough wealth to flaunt it, you know, like yeah. those two giants. But the value that they place on humility is exceptional. I remember being in my friend's house and the, and the daughter of the family was really good at baseball, um, basketball, basketball. She was really good at basketball. And her mother was very keen to say, don't brag about it, don't say too much, let all your other classmates feel okay, don't, you know, please don't um, show off. And it wasn't just that talent that she didn't show off. They didn't show off about anything and everyone else was the same, even, the president at the time, um, you know, lived in a simple farmhouse, did his own chores, still has his little three-legged dog, went back, you know, had a very normal salary and just kept things very normal because he kept his ground on the feet, feet on the ground and had this level of humility and groundedness that I really thought was exceptional and something we can all learn from. So, it's not to say that I, that I have only spoken about observations, but each of those values start off with an observation or start off with a personal story, something that no one can take away from me. I experienced what I experienced. Then I back it up with um, what the country is known for, you know, all the stuff in the PhD, the geography, the history, the climate, the, the political structure, the, relig the religion, 
all the different nuances that create culture and create society. And then in the end, and these are kind of two, three page vignettes per country. In the end, I talk about how each of those values could change your own life. Because if it's not practical to you, I just think if books don't leave you somewhere different, if they don't move you in some way, why are we reading? Exactly, exactly. And, and actually regarding Uruguay, the most amazing thing right now, a few, month, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a whole transatlantic uh, bo uh, um, boat full of, of people infected. And Uruguay was a country who let them come in, in, in and, and, and had them fly out. So all these hundreds of thousands of people are very grateful to Uruguay for that. And to think, I'm sure the other countries around them have very similar resources. So, you know, testament and brilliant Uruguay. So basically, I invite you all, when this is over, to go to Uruguay or to Qatar. I think these are places to go because your values will be, will be met, the values that matter. So going back to uh, what is a value for you? What is value? I mean, I think, say, Aristotle, the Greeks, is, and today, everybody is, what are values? You know, tell us. Yes. Great question. Um, I studied all those philosophers. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize you hadn't finished your question. Yeah. Um, I, I just had a thought. I just want to make sure that before this interview, we didn't, Lara and I didn't choose the countries we would talk about. Um, and I want to make sure that no one thinks that this, that I have pegged any one country above another. I've been, hopefully, equally, um, I've chosen one inspirational, positive, aspirational, incredible value for each nation um, equally. So just as much as there's uh, humility in Uruguay, there's love from Brazil, there's passion from Argentina, there's perspective in Chile. And whether you agree with the words I'm using or not, um, and whether you agree with what I've written or not, the point is simply that there is beauty everywhere and something we can celebrate everywhere. And it's something that's really worth doing, especially now whilst you can't travel, to really be inspired by the rest of the world. So to come to your question about what are values? The way I have defined it for the purpose of this book or study is a value is something that you think is important, that you personally value. It could be health. Right now, the planet has decided that the single most important value is health and life as opposed to death. And so everyone has dramatically changed their life in order to prevent further deaths to take place. Um, but before this pandemic and before the world that we're currently living in, we were all living with a completely different set of values depending on what we thought was important. Some people grow up and they're kind of brought up to um, chase what I would call resume values, you know, values that to study hard, to work hard, to uh, do the right things, to tick the right boxes, to get onto the career ladder, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Other people might look at, and this is kind of a shift I think you make, and it, the, the book kind of makes this shift a little bit or this distinction for you, might look at eulogy values. So what is it that you'd like to be known for? What is it that you'd like your life to stand for? What would you want said at your funeral, at your eulogy, um, or for, as your eulogy? And as you think about what, what it is that you want to be known for, very easily you realize that actually that won't happen unless you spend your time to reflect that. So right now, I am seeing a global shift in values. We're seeing a shift from kind of individualism or competitiveness or kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog type uh, attitude to more compassion, collaboration, cooperation, connectivity. And there's, it's almost like human decency is finally being celebrated. We're seeing that nature is, you know, coming back and clean, you know, cleaning our and cleaning the air, cleaning our lungs so that we can really appreciate the beautiful things that we have surrounding us rather than just chasing for the material, for example. Yes, and so basically values change because culture changes. I think it takes time to change the culture of a country and it takes time to also take change. Uh, but 
values can be also, you know, we have the usual eternal values that matter and, and so forth. But uh, so when, when you were, um, uh, if you can tell us more about who is, uh, um, uh, um, uh, tell us more about your gender lens uh, views throughout the countries you traveled and what happened there, given that this is a, uh, Be Women is trying to, one of our uh, objective is uh, uh, sus sustainability in companies and gender equality and climate change in, 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 uh, agendas. Uh, great question. Um, one thing I, that struck me was that the countries that you'd expect that there's more gender equality might surprise you. So for example, um, I was personally, I was still quite surprised when Hillary didn't win the election um, and Trump did. Not because, not because of a different, you know, not because of being a Democrat or a Republican, but much more because um, I do think that if we just take it on the kind of arguments that they, the discussions and the debates they had and the offering they had, that in somewhere deep in our psyche, there, we're not really necessarily yet at a point where we can accept or where America can accept a female leader, perhaps. Just a thought. And I thought, wow, really? We had Indra Gandhi, um, a female uh, prime minister in India, when I was born in 1979, today's my birthday, and um, I'm 41, and she was born, oh, I remember Margaret Thatcher was elected on this very day 41 years ago. So that's Margaret Thatcher in England. And Indra Gandhi, you know, we have incredible, I, I've been fortunate in that either the country I'm living in or the country I'm from, I'm third generation British, but very Indian, um, have seen great female leaders. But also if you see the female leaders around us today, New Zealand, Germany, Iceland, um, we're just Taiwan, we're seeing incredible female leadership, especially when it comes to COVID-19. And yet, who's bearing the majority of the burden during this pandemic? It's actually women. Who, like there's a real, um, there's a real contrast in how much more women are having to do than men. So we're all in lockdown, but yet who's having to pick up the duties of perhaps educating the children or homeschooling the children, as well as cooking, as well as cleaning, as well as making sure everything's organized and sane, as well as doing the job that they originally had. And why is that not fairly distributed? There's this kind of deep set patriarchy that we're still battling today. And yet there'll be other societies that I went to where it's much more equal. Now in the Western kind of model, I found those societies that are equal where um, paternity cover, for example, um, or paternity pay is equal. So a man is encouraged to take six months or a year off just as a woman is, and they're paid exactly the same. And so that that kind of, um, financial or economic inequality in the home doesn't develop in the same way than if only the woman can take off a year or you know and then when she goes back she doesn't necessarily have the same position or immediately there's a step change in her career such that she'll never earn the same such that her husband then goes on to or her partner goes on to this kind of higher earning trajectory, which means there's a forever an imbalance in their income, which means there's a forever imbalance in who's making the kind of more important or the family decisions. And that imbalance is then seen by the children. And it's just, what a waste, because we know for a fact that those, that graduation years, women or girls are coming out with higher grades and better percentages and there's more women graduating etc cetera, etc cetera. and yet when it comes to earning why are men and women still not paid the same why are more women being furloughed why are, i mean not being paid to do the same, very same job and not being paid the very same salary i'm gobsmacked that we are still fighting this and we're still fighting this in some of the most you know, 
developed yeah and and across industries we're still fighting this in big institutions we're still fighting this in governments we're still, it is shocking it is shocking and then you go to communities like indigenous communities for example i remember being in small villages in um in, ja in like in indonesia um where there's much more of a matriarch where it's very clear who's making the decisions and who's calling the shots. And I'm not saying that there needs to be a patriarch or a matriarch. I'm just an advocate for things being equal and there's a way of making things equal. And I just hope that after COVID-19, there's this um, movement called Good After COVID-19. And I hope that one of those the things that is like a good that comes after this period, because life will never be the same again. May, one of the good things that come out of this is that we recognize the effort that each of us, let's say, uh, we're, we're known in a partnership, how much effort is going into keeping a household running and for that to be valued in the same way. And more importantly, for governments and institutions to value that also, so that a woman is not paid less than a man and their value is in, as human beings is exactly the same. There's no reason why we should pay one more than the other for the same job. And there's no reason that when a child is born, it should only be one gender's responsibility and not the other gender's responsibility. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and thank you for mentioning, we actually met through the good after COVID uh, um, uh, fishbowl that was amazing. So I saw you uh, making a comment. I said, oh, I need to have her in our in there to share because it's true the gender equality i mean 85 percent of all the care workers worldwide today are women and if you look at the care economy you uh, one of the things that most humans treasure the most is the, is their kids and and dedicating their time to the kids instead a, a caretaker maybe is paid between eight to to $15 an hour, while the plumber is paid uh, uh, 10 times more when uh, we are leaving the, our most, most important treasures uh, with somebody who we do not value as much. And, and plumbers have licenses, but maybe we should have licenses for caretakers and really uplift caretaking that is the essence of our society. Indeed. But, uh, yeah. And I'll make sure that anybody who wants to make a question after these comments, uh, please think of questions and please uh, join and unmute yourself or raise your hand in, and then unmute yourself, please. Yes. And to that point, I just want to say that um, unless, unless we're kind of paid the same at, let's say, maternity, paternity, and what, firstly, if our jobs are paid the same, and then two, we're paid the same at maternity, paternity, and then that childcare is not so expensive that we're having to give up our work. I remember there was a moment when I paid to go to work, as in, I, it would be economically more beneficial for me to stay at home than to go to work. And that is ludicrous, right? <laughs> like, and it's happening because childcare in some societies and economies and definitely in the, in the UK is so expensive. Um, so although I agree with you that carers, the caring economy needs to be paid properly, we also need to make sure that the, the caring or the socialization of children. So for example, children going to nursery or children going to kindergarten or wherever isn't so expensive that then one member of the household has to give up work in order to and it should be the case that both parents are encouraged by their workplaces and themselves and society to be part of that child's life not for just one parent to educate or to nurture that child but both of us and COVID-19 is awful I'm not trying to pretend it's good but if after this it means that both parents have been part of educating homeschooling their children and both parents are involved in that child's life then great. And if it means that both parents for now actively take that responsibility going forward, then great. Because it takes two people to produce a child, it should take two people or a whole village, in fact, to raise a child and for that to be affordable and not crippling. That's it. So please, anybody who wants to uh, ask a question to uh, Mandeep 
or raise your hand or, or unmute yourself. And um, on that note, I just want to ask you, Mandeep, if you can give us some, um, some thoughts of, uh, of, are you planning to write another book? Out of everything we talked, I think you could write at least five or six books, but what, it, what are your thoughts what, going forward? Because anybody should be writing their, their essence and sharing it with the world. So tell us more about that. That's very kind. Um, but guys, do please um, raise your hands and ask questions also, because at this time, it's a shame if we don't connect and don't, um, you know, we're meant to be a resource for one another. And I'd like to be, a re you know, I'd like to be sharing and caring within this conversation also. Um, and also to the point of what we were talking about regarding gender, um, I just wanted to say that the countries that I think are doing it quite well are the Scandinavian countries. Um, where there is that balance of, you know, childcare is made affordable and both parents are involved. To your point about the next book, um, in lockdown, I don't think I'd be able to get to the other countries, but as soon as I'm able, I would love to kind of almost complete this journey. 101, uh, 101 is great. And probably doing 200 books, countries in one book would have been too much, but I'd love to one, complete the other half of the world. Um, not that there's a half of the world that's missing, but there are 99 other countries that I'd love to cover. Um, and also to create a children's version of this, because I have found in the last, my children are now eight and seven. In the years that they've been, so for the last nine years, we've been holding values classes at home. And that when I talk to my children about values, academic education we can get. But to get a to get an education where you're aware of the importance of service or how being compassionate or caring or loving towards one another, how important or how that can be life changing or how even just being honest can be life changing or, you know, all the values I talk about in the book, we have kind of to, to bring those down at a point where right from the get go our children are being seeded with those. And I'm finding, I'm working with several, with many schools, and I'm finding that when schools are really clear about their values, um, and basically the book is an exercise, it's a tool to help you boil down or summarize down to your core, your top five values. And when schools do this, it makes a profound difference to the children that come out of those institutions. So for example, if you put teamwork as one of your core values, then the way you play sports, the way you are, are, um, you know, are a service to society or a member of society, the way you encourage your other classmates, the way you are going forward. And when that is celebrated because you're celebrating teamwork, that child is a completely different child than if you're just encouraging, let's say, a competitive spirit. Thank you. And we have a few questions. I don't know if Marisa, you are or Meditation Buddha, you want to just uh, come up and ask the questions directly. Marisa, you're unmuted yet, still. Oh, hi. Um, so uh, my question is, it's, it's one when I work, when I've worked with organizations um, uh, and even at educational institutions, I'm so sorry, I've got a, there's drilling behind me in the background here. Um, my question is when you are in your experience dealing with organizational leaders who are stuck in what they refer to as their established values, since we know values are dynamic, right? And that, that they shift and should shift with time. But many, especially in, in bigger organizations or, and in educational institutions, you know, they've listed what they believe are their, these are our values. And they don't uh, want to relook at those and renew and kind of develop. So what is your experience with that in terms of uh, working or dealing with those kinds of organizations? So if I, if I understood your question correctly, your question is values are dynamic. So what if an organization becomes static in, it, in its values? Is yes. that the question? Yeah. Okay. I completely agree that values are dynamic. Um, but we as individuals are a combination of our values come from nature and nurture. We're born thinking certain things are important. You know, you, you have some children who coming out of the womb fight for justice. <laughs> you know, if something's not fair, let's say that the second, they're the second child. If something's not fair, 
they'll, you'll know about it and very quickly, let's say. And there are other values that happen because something happened when you were younger. Normally, by the time you're 18, your values, even though they are dynamic, are set as in your core values, what really matters to you. And you know what they are often when they're violated. So for example, here in the UK, when Brexit was happening, people didn't think inclusion was important. People didn't even think they needed to vote for Brexit, those that didn't, uh, that wanted to remain in Europe, until that right was taken away. And when that was taken away, they thought, oh, I feel like I've been punched in the stomach. Or let's say, um, uh, honesty is something that's very important to you. As soon as you're lied to, you might be willing to walk out of a relationship, an organization. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a game changer, a line that should never be crossed, for example. That people have, without knowing it, certain values that, that are, a, are, are a no-go area. Now, within an institution, um, and the book helps you find what they are, and the book also helps you prioritize your core values. Now, when an institution has its set of values, we have to think, or basically I've worked with many institutions, and there are many different ways of coming up with your core values. Some companies ask, for example, PwC, ask all their thousands of employees, what do you think you st we stand for? And what do you think is important to us? Or what, what should be important to us? Uh, Unilever and other co companies like MasterCard. But then there are other companies that right from the get-go decide these are our values. Let's say, for example, with the BBC, I know impartiality, to be informative, to be bold, etc. There are certain values that are just there and have always been there and is what the institution stands for. Now, to answer your question about dynamic and static, we have to think about where do those values come from? Do those values come from because that is what the organization, that's what all the employees think? Do those all values come from because that's what the leadership thinks? Or indeed, that's what the very, you know, that's what the CEO thinks or the chairman thinks or the chairperson? Um, or so are those values organic or are those values coming from the top? Now, for us as individuals, even though I kind of described to you how almost static our values are, it's also not true. As in, we can decide, depending on which perspective we look at, we can either look from our past or from our future, we can decide which values choose the set of values we want to focus on. So even though certain things are important to us, we could decide, well, this is not serving me. Um, I am going to choose, let's say, service, gratitude or generosity, and um, excellence as my core values. Once you've kind of created that, the book helps you do it for a period of time. So you choose your core values or your five top values for until you meet a certain objective. This could be whilst you're looking after your elderly parents or until you get that next job promotion or until you've run the marathon, whatever objective or whatever time period you decide. But if an organization hasn't created any of those things, any of those metrics, different time periods, or those um, values are coming right from the top and they're not about to change, then you as an individual have to ask yourself, okay, this is the way it's always going to be here. I'm an employee. I don't potentially resonate with these values. So what am I going to do? And you have to make your choice. The reason I say that is because I think the reason I'm just, values become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once an organization has decided these are our values, they then employ people according to those values. And it becomes a culture. And it be, they, um, they can reward people according to those values, depending on how, how seriously they're taking it. They can remunerate according to those values. They will praise people according to those values. And if that value set really doesn't sit with you, then, um, then not to fool yourself that it might change if it has never changed and if you don't see them take a dynamic period bound view. I, I, that's a bit of a difficult um, answer to stomach and 
if there's something else on your mind or if there's you know if i haven't answered your question properly do let me know it's just it's a very it's a very slippery slope because you especially in education right when the, those those values have been established by someone else yes you, you know the end and yes in coaching people that the individual can find one grain one raisin right you know to to choose i'm just interested when the values really um, have become are, are no longer reflective of what's actually happening in an organization oh i see i see so we're talking about an educational institution and we're saying that the values is it is it that you don't agree with the values or is it that you don't agree with what's happening is that the the people in the organization don't believe that the values that were established are reflective of what their what their experience is of what the experience is would it be fair to say then that if the organization was true to its values the people of the organization would be happier possibly in some cases in some cases it's really the, the values are outdated the values are outdated okay i mean look values are hugely important we don't realize that but the culture of an organization or the culture of our family or indeed we are completely built by these values so it becomes our culture you know what we believe what what's important and so all our decisions are based on our values and again it's not something that's ever talked about in this way or if i asked if i asked the average joe what are your values they'd be like what are you talking about like it's a very hard kind of question to answer but if i say to you um if i come about it in a tangential way and say who do you admire and what um what do you admire in them normally they are the values that are important to you yeah excellent thank you uh, marisa we have another question by um, a woman from in chile it says what are the values that we are leaving behind during our isolations and what are the ones we're going to move towards is it easy to to predict where we're going because some people actually talk even in one of our uh, um, uh, good for the uh, uh, good after COVID, they were talking about the dark side uh, of of nature and there's a lot of values that are very negative we have a lot of things that are very negative but we have also a lot of positive things so in your experience after traveling so many countries where do you see us going? That's a brilliant question. Um, so firstly, we should kind of thank Good After COVID-19 and Giovanna and uh, everyone there in the team. Um, and also, I think for I'd like to thank all those kind of communities that are really working on this period, not being a wasted period, for this period to be a true, a true moment of transformation. Um, and to kind of take this, the changes that are happening, bring out the best in them and take them forward into our next life or whatever the new normal becomes after this. So to answer the question of what do I predict will happen next? So firstly, the, the way that each country has responded um, generally to this pandemic has been completely in line with its individual value set. I didn't expect it, but China was completely pragmatic England stuck with being really kind of keep calm, carry on, being steadfast. America was quite, did a complete pivot, was quite entrepreneurial about it. Uh, Italy, kind of this attention to detail and care. Um, so each nation has gone about it in a different way. But what are the values that will come out after this? To your point about the shadow side, that is 100% true, even if um, it doesn't matter which positive value or which value or virtue we are talking about, in excess, it, is, it has a shadow. Anything in excess has a shadow. So, for example, if you're looking at the value of even love, over-loving can, can not necessarily serve you, can be detrimental. Um, being overly passionate or being overly entrepreneurial or overly um, putting too much importance on excellence, for example. All of these things in excess are detrimental or can have that shadow side. And that's why it's important to choose 
a variety to choose at least five. Not too many that it becomes overwhelming and they become meaningless, but not too few that you can't create a balance. What do I think will become important going forward? Well, I hope that the lessons that we're learning right now are that um, collaborating with one another rather than always thinking there has to be a winner or loser to come up with win-win solutions. Um, to see the, the importance of compassion and service and service, not just of ourselves, but of, of our communities. Um, and to really see that within organizations and businesses in particular, for those you're going, we're, going, we're seeing those businesses are thriving right now. Um, we're seeing how countries are bulking at, you know, non-collaboration where some countries are saying, no, we're not going to share these particular resources or whatever. You're seeing that there's a real kind of backlash to that and being, collaborative and sharing is the way forward. Um, hopefully putting a lot more emphasis, like you said, on the care economies and both caring professions and the care economies and for those to have equal value um, and for those to be elevated. I think all of these are hopefully inevitable shifts. So for example, I'm definitely seeing that it shouldn't be the case that we only value doctors, nurses, the healthcare, education system, et cetera, now because we can't take it for granted or because we're seeing it service. These should always be valued. Wow, that was such a, a beautiful answer. I don't know if there's any other questions, but I think we are a little bit past the hour, and, but I think we could talk forever about this values uh, and, and our community. So would you like to have, uh, to have some closing remarks to give us some nuggets of, of, of what, to, what do you think uh, your true passion is about and, and moving forward? Yeah, I'd like to say that um, I used to feel, again, I'm being very intimate with you guys. I feel like this is just a sacred little sisterhood. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to continue on that wave. I used to think, um, wow, my mother closed a door for me. Like she, out of her wanting me to take a particular path, she stopped certain opportunities happening. She stopped me going to a certain um, university, which stopped me doing this, that and the other. And um, I think in this period where we're seeing either more burden put on women or even like the rise in domestic violence, the rise in, like there are so many unfortunate situations, not just regarding women, but we're seeing so much, like the face, the ugly face of inequality is really, really clear. Those who are losing their jobs and actually will struggle to feed their children, for example, um, you know, unintended consequences in different parts of the world because certain things aren't being produced or indeed because berries aren't being picked and therefore the, that food kind of line would be disappeared. You know, there are so many unintended consequences, but awful consequences that will come about. Um, and I made it personal because I wanted to show that even though originally I had thought, ah, I'm not going to listen to my mother again, or that's such a shame, or I've got to follow, you know, my own value set, even though that's all the case. Um, we are, I'm also wouldn't be the person I am today and wouldn't have taken the journey I did had that not happened to me. And so whatever experience you're going through right now, I shouldn't say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but there are so many jewels and gems and valuable, um, this kind of valuable resource base that's coming up right now. Um, where we're finding kind of our inner strength and resilience and uh, more patience than we thought we had. And we're having to face whatever it is internally, we're having to face that much more directly, that all of these are gifts. This is um, as difficult as it is to face, can be transformed into one of your greatest assets also this period. So just coming from a kind of a place of sisterhood, let's kind of enlighten each other, empower each other and support each other so that going forward, this has served us to our kind of, to a high, so that we, we end up on a higher plane or a more, more evolved plane as a result. My God, uh, 
But Deep, I'm so grateful. This has been such a treat and it has been so heart, uh, heartfelt from everybody in the chat. Everybody is saying, this is great. I love it. I support you. This is the best thing. Uh, thank you so much. But we, as always in Be Women, what we truly believe is in when we get inspired, when we hear things that matter, we need to act now. So I ask you all to get a, a pencil and a piece of paper and write down now, what is it that this, uh, this uh, uh, what Mandeep has said has inspired you? What are you gonna do to change? What are you gonna say from today, my life is gonna change because we're gonna move on this direction. Where, what are you gonna do? So please, if you wanna share it on the chat, write it or uh, write it on a piece of paper, but please get it done today. Do that, that what matters. So I, while you write that, maybe you wanna say something? Just, just a quick one. I am so glad you said that, Lara, because it's the one thing I never say at the end. And I'm so glad you did. And I, just to say that whatever you write down, to then share it, share it three times. Share it now with your family potentially, and maybe even come up with the five values that you have as a family. It will transform your family, believe me. Um, then share it tomorrow with someone, your sister, your friend, whomever, and then share it on Monday. And once you've shared it three times, it is solidified. You won't forget it. I love that. That's a great tool. I think that's, I'm always up to how can we create habits that are really going to persist in our heart. So on that note, while you're writing what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, I would like to share some amazing upcoming webinars. Our next English webinar, because we have many also in Spanish and Italian, is on the 6th of May, and it's going to be really amazing. It's about the author of a book called The Real Wealth of Nation, Creating a Caring Economy by Rise, uh, Rianne Eisler. She is also uh, an, an amazing um, individual who started what we call the caring revolution over 10 years ago and is moving suddenly now it's happening and uh, I truly believe that her her, her this book that was uh, is like the next uh, uh, Adam Smith book is a, a must read for everybody as well and uh, also again on values uh, we have another author called Eve Rotsky her, uh, her book is called um, a Values Start at Home. So uh, when, when you at home start with your values, clearly is what you portray in your community, in your family, in your job, in your, in your nation. So it's going to be a fun talk about that. Then we have also a, a call about the cost. As you know, Be Women has started this initiative of creating awareness of that uh, as of COVID, 30 most countries have risen uh, from that base, their domestic violence, 30%. So domestic violence is huge today. And so um, we have a, um, a few talking about the cost of domestic violence as a global pandemic. That is also a pandemic that is more than 5,000 years old and nothing has been done really I mean, very little step has been done. And so we need to really step the, 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 the value on that. And on that note, I want to thank you all. Mandil, thank you. Uh, Marisa, for your comments. And everybody else here for participating on this amazing, amazing uh, uh, discussion. Thank you all. And we'll see you uh, shortly. Thank you. In our next. Thank you. Bye-bye.